on behalf of the people of the great state of California, the President of the United States. This valley and others like it across the country, where we can see the greenest and most richest earth producing the greatest and richest crops in the country, and then a mile away, see the same earth and see it brown and dusty and useless, and all because there's water in one place and there isn't in another. What you see here is um, orange grove that had been in production for over a hundred years, and this is what's left of it. This is a grove that we used to pick fruit alongside my family when we were kids, and it's very sad to see what's happening. This is the first groves that are going out, and there's more to follow and it's gonna put this area in a really bad situation. It's gonna put us out of business. If there's not a change in the water situation, more of this is gonna be happening. Water brings life to California. It sustains our cities, nourishes our spirit. turns the Central Valley's brown, dusty earth into the greenest and most abundant land in the world. It provides jobs to support families and build communities. A quarter of America's food is grown here. But without water, the valley dies. We're standing in a field that has been continuously farmed since the mid-1800s. Every summer it's had a crop grown on it until this year. There's nothing going on here, which means there's a whole bunch of economic activity that should be going on, it's not. Lack of water, plain and simple, lack of water. What we have here is trees that are on life support. Not enough water to grow a healthy tree, support a crop. So what we've done is cut the canopy back to the level that it will take about 25% of normal water to keep these trees alive. And hopefully we can grow them back to a healthy, full tree. Even though it looks somewhat attractive from a, from a landscaping standpoint, this is a disaster from a production standpoint. We didn't have enough water, we couldn't buy enough water, and the groundwater here is, is so limited, it wouldn't support a third of the orchard. So we had to take some of it out. So if this continues again, probably next year we'll cut back more trees, but we'll probably push maybe 20 to 25% of our acreage, which is a significant loss.
all this land that was idle right now would have been tomatoes, uh, garlic, onions, cantaloupes. This is the first year we haven't grown cantaloupes in 60 years. 60 years we haven't grown cantaloupes. And the amount of people that are employed uh, during uh, cantaloupe production is, I mean, it's, it's, it's about 10 people per every acre of cantaloupes. And we normally have 600 acres of cantaloupes, but we can't, the, the return per acre foot of water is not there on cantaloupes, so we're not growing them now. This is the, the, the most productive land in the world is in the San Joaquin Valley. The most productive, I mean, that's a pretty bold statement. We have the most productive land in the world in the San Joaquin Valley, and we're trying to shut it down. The government is. It makes no sense at all. Why would you do that? Central Valley Congressman Devin Nunes was one of the first to warn that valley water was being threatened by federal policies. The cities, the towns, the farms, everybody needs water here. So if you shut off the water, you're not going to have farming, you're not going to have farm workers, you're not going to have manufacturing, you're not going to have anything here. The son of a dairy farmer and a farmer himself, Nunes met with the Natural Resources Defense Council and other environmental groups when he first ran for Congress in 2002. They told him that 1.3 million acres of farmland should be returned to its natural desert state. They said none of this land should be farmed. They had a map and they showed me the whole thing. These are people who have a plan, they've had a plan for a long time, and they've been slowly implementing it piece by piece by piece. The focus of this dream of re-engineering California, returning it back to the 19th century, is the Bay Area. That's where these ideas take root. So they're dictating and adjudicating policy for people in the interior that they do not see as cultural, intellectual, social equals, but rather people that just sort of do their thing and they sort of are valuable to give us stuff, but we really don't worry about the impact of our ideas upon them. A lethal combination of federal laws and environmental lawsuits has dramatically reduced valley water supplies diverting billions of gallons to environmental causes like protecting fish, regardless of the social and economic cost. While California's drought has added to the problem, the damage won't stop when rain returns. The disaster that you see here today has been created because of government. It's a man-made drought. In 1992, you had the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. That took over a million acre feet of water away. In 2009, you had the San Joaquin River Settlement Act. That took another 250,000 acre feet away. You take the endangered species lawsuits on top of that and you have well over a million acre feet. That's why there's a shortage today. It's not because of drought. It's because of these three laws that, are, that were passed and are being abused and they took millions of acre feet of water and now it's just it's millions and millions of acre feet of water and they've dumped it out to the ocean and they're wasting it. It's time for the Ray Appleton Show on News Talk 580 KMJ. I've been farming almost 30 years, and this could be the end. Congressman Devin Nunes in the KMJ studios as we yak up water. One thing that uh, we have to keep in focus, uh, and I think we've done a pretty good job of it, is the uh, the human impact from all of this. I mean, the... Uh, the, 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 the cost of business, the cost of farming, the cost of unemployment. It, it's, I don't even know you write the number on a chalkboard. It's just been horrendous. You know, it's terrible. Well, and you've, seen the, you've seen the food lines, Ray. Oh, yeah. And one thing that bothers me is here you are in the most productive agricultural region on earth, on earth. And the people who are picking the crops don't have work, so they have to go stand in a food line. To me, that it's just... It's amazing to me that people in this state, in Los Angeles and the Bay Area, would think this is okay. I just think it's a – I'd like to think that people are good, that people are genuinely care about human lives and genuinely yeah. want these people to, to live uh, in, a, in a healthy, safe environment, have a job, especially the ones that are out there toiling away in the, in the dust and the dirt to provide food for us. You would think they'd want them to have food and not have to stand in a damn food line.
it's tough to watch. It's just a tough thing to watch the children come with their mother or their father and their eyes get real big when they see the food that they're getting. So they understand. They understand that their parents are having a hard time. They, they rather work than be out here. Some of them even are embarrassed to be out here getting the food because they worked before. They never were in the situation that they are now. And they feel embarrassed, but they have to live like that. They have no choice. En años para atrás no había necesidad de elegir entre comer o vestir y ahorita no puedes y ellos se preocupan qué está pasando dice mi muchacho Él le digo pues mira cómo están tumbándonos el trabajo las huertas de naranja todas las están tirando no hay agua So that's what I see I see people in need people who are proud who rather be working Towns all over this valley are being decimated. This is one of the poorest areas in the United States of America. And it's largely due to the fact that the government is not providing water to the people that live here. Sadly, the people of the San Joaquin Valley have become collateral damage uh, in the effort to take all this land and put it out of production. We typically spend $2,500 to $3,000 an acre on this land growing a, a product, we're not spending that now. So that's affecting our local communities, um, the uh, auto parts store, the grocery store, the tractor dealers, that sort of stuff. We're not spending money on that, that sort of stuff right now. We're trying to cut as much of that out as we possibly can and get by the bare minimum. It's a lot of jobs that are impacted by that. If the farmer doesn't grow oranges or uh, that means that people won't be working in the packing houses, people won't be working in the fields picking the oranges, so that means that they don't have money to fix their toilets or fix a water leak or fix the roofs, which, you know, they put it off because they don't have the money, so which means that we don't have business to, to supply them with supplies to do their, their home repairs. You'll see a lot of empty storefronts, um, a, lot, a lot of local businesses, old-time businesses that have been around for a long time just were no longer viable. Down here, you got businesses that have been in business 70, 80, 90, 100 years, and they've been passing out paychecks for that entire time. That should be something California should be proud of, not something that they're looking to get rid of. And that's what's happening today. It's one of the first roles of the government is to provide water to people. If you can't get that right, you're never going to have a situation where your jobs can be created on a continual, annual basis. California was on the move in the 1960s, building freeways, bridges, dams, and other infrastructure. Visionary leaders like then-Governor Edmund G. Brown Sr. understood that water was vital for the state's economy and quality of life, and in 1960 began construction of the California State Water Project to complement the already existing federal Valley Water Project designed to irrigate valley farms. Together, they form a network of aqueducts and pumping stations that transfers water from Northern California to the San Francisco Bay Area and through the Central Valley via the California Aqueduct. At the end of the journey, large pumps lift the water over the Tehachapi Mountains to Southern California. The system was designed to provide water for the state's urban areas and for farming in the Central Valley. But starting in 1992, the system became the target of federal laws and environmental lawsuits that would make it increasingly impossible for the system to keep its promise to valley farmers. Federal Judge Oliver Wanger, now retired, presided over many of the cases. The water world in the Central Valley completely was turned on its head October 31st of 1992 
when a congressman and a senator were able to shepherd through the United States Congress the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. One of the purposes of this law is to double the fish populations. And so what that means is that you have to manage the water projects in such a way that it does not create hazard, that it does not, they, they love this, this is an environmental word, extirpate. Guess what extirpate means? Kill. So that it doesn't kill the fishes. Using the Central Valley Project Improvement Act and the Endangered Species Act, environmental groups began suing. Ground zero in their fight was the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta in Northern California, near the Bay Area, where the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers converge and flow into the sea. Two large pumping stations, the state-run Banks Pumping Station and the federally operated Jones Pumping Station, lift water from the Delta into canals serving parts of the Bay Area and the San Joaquin Valley, and into the California Aqueduct for its journey through the valley to Southern California and urban areas along the Central Coast. But in their lawsuits, the Natural Resources Defense Council and other groups claim the pumps were killing the endangered Delta smelt, a three-inch long fish found only in the Delta. What's going on with the water is hugely consequential for the farmers, and if you've got somebody up there with their thumb on the switch, the off and on switch for the pumps, you have a problem. Saying he had no choice under the law, Judge Wanger ruled in favor of the environmental groups in 2008. As a result, pumping operations were dramatically reduced, even though rural and municipal water districts had contracted with the government for that water. When is a contract not a contract? And the answer is, anytime you contract with the United States. The law was on the government's side. And when these issues came up, so what happened? They took the water from the reservoirs. They didn't send it to the Delta and South, to the pumps. They sent it down the river, out to the Pacific Ocean. Millions of acre feet of water. And that got more and more extreme. Since 2008, more than 1.4 trillion gallons of Delta water, once used for valley farms and towns, have been flushed out to sea. One of the great battles that has been waged is, is it enough to splash water on a fish, as they say, and then let it go on to other purposes? And the environmentalists said, absolutely not. The answer always is more water. Well, we're now at the tipping point where if you want more water, you're going to run Los Angeles and San Francisco out of water, not just us here in the San Joaquin Valley. Another drain on the valley's water supply is the San Joaquin River Restoration Settlement Act, which includes a $1.3 billion federal program designed to restore salmon to the upper part of the river, taking water once used for valley farms. Before all these water projects were built, the San Joaquin Valley would flood. So over the years, salmon would eventually make their way up even to the farthest reaches of the river. Well, once we began to tame the rivers and to control the water and deliver water to cities and farms, there's the one section of river where the salmon are gone. But yet, the salmon are never going to come back. They've been gone for 100 years. So no matter how much money you want to spend trying to bring those salmon back, they're not going to come back, ever. We've got this new problem now. Parts of Central California are sinking a lot more than we thought they were uh, due to groundwater, the lack of groundwater, and uh, no more groundwater recharge. Some areas up to 10 feet. We've got bridges that are sinking. We've got houses that are beginning to crack as a result of this. Have you followed this at all? Yeah. Have you gotten and, this info? Well, and the, and this is the problem. So so they've run, if you, if you quit delivering surface supplies to the San Joaquin Valley, and then you put in... You force people to drill new wells, and you force us to take more water out of the ground that's going in, and you have the subsidence. And now the state comes in and says, well, we can't have subsidence. Well, 
why don't you give us our water back and we wouldn't have subsidence? That would be the fix. The groundwater regulations are the final stab in our back because you're going to have to – whatever water you take out of the ground, you're going to have to prove that you're putting that water back in. Mm-hmm. If you don't – if you're not going to do that, then that leads to land retirement. You're looking at you know, roughly 800,000 to over a million acres that's got to be idle. Valley farmers rely on two sources of water, surface water from lakes and rivers and groundwater from aquifers, deep underground lakes found throughout the Central Valley. While surface water is better for farming, federal restrictions brought by environmental lawsuits have forced farmers to rely increasingly on groundwater. As proof there is water down there of a drop of rock in it, you can listen and listen and listen, and when it gets to about 178 feet, it'll hit water. water. That's the good news. The bad news is it's the deepest it's ever been since this was drilled in 1946. And so now, uh, you know, the, the state, various state agencies are looking to us and, hey guys, you know, you're, you're, you're overdrafting and you can't do that anymore. You're going to have to put a plan together. Well, the only plan in the absence of some additional surface supplies is to fallow ground, idle ground. Our groundwater will only farm about 60 percent of our farm. Now we have this groundwater legislation implemented. By 2020, we're only going to be able to pump so much water out of the ground. So I don't know what's that going to do. Are we going to be able to farm 35 or 40 percent of our farm? This is ground that we have mortgages on and there's costs associated with ownership. And the government takes our surface supply and, uh, and now is going to restrict the water that we can pump from our underground to support us. Now wait. You cut off the water in the first place, you tell us to use the groundwater, and now you're going to come in and regulate the groundwater too? This is all part of the master plan of taking this valley out of production and turning it back into a desert. As part of the plan to fallow valley farms, the Endangered Species Act has become a favorite weapon among environmental groups who have used it to file thousands of lawsuits since its passage in 1973, using the law to block new water storage projects, take down existing dams, and increase river flows for fish by draining reservoirs of water normally used for farms and municipal drinking water, even in times of drought. It's a political tool for a small group of elitists to say, you know what, we don't like this sector of the economy, or we don't like these 100,000 acres of land used in a particular way, so we're going to find a particular newt, a particular rat, a particular dragonfly, and then we will make a melodramatic, psychodramatic crisis, and then we can further that political aim. We've got to the point now that almost any species no matter its size or its nature or its pernicious or advantageous role, cannot have its population affected by man. And that's an impossible mission to accomplish. We don't put, in balancing the hardships, the other side of the environment on the scale. The environment is simply, by congressional mandate, more important. Is there ever an exception? How about when human, when the human species, is on the scale and is threatened? That's an open question under the law. What needs to be done? The law needs to be changed. Everywhere in the state is running out of water. And this was entirely predictable. This is what we had talked about you know, years ago, that if we kept going down this road, not only would you run the San Joaquin Valley out of water, you would run the cities out of water. And that's what we've done. And what is only the third year of drought Hey, it's a bad drought. It's a bad three-year drought. But this is nothing compared to the drought from 87 to 92. And if you go back and look at the 1930s, let's hope we don't have another drought like we had in the 1930s. That was like a seven- or eight-year drought. If we're on one of those right now, it's gonna get, it, it could get really ugly here in the next few years. Are you, are you paying attention to any of these predictions for the, uh, the Godzilla Super Nino of, uh, of, uh, that's allegedly coming our way? 
if we indeed get that, we'll get all this rain and we're not going to be able to hold that's, on to it again. I mean, that, that's, that's just, right. That's you know, right. We're still not going to learn by this. No, that's exactly right, Ray. And three years ago, everybody forgets we had the wettest year since like 1983. And all that water, all the snowpack, and, we, and it was all wasted. We just went out to the ocean. As part of their campaign against valley agriculture, environmentalists claim valley farmers use a disproportionate share of the state's water, taking up to 80% to grow food at the expense of cities and the environment, a claim that isn't true. Farmers use anywhere between 30 and 40% of the water for the right reason. 30 to 40% of the water in the state is used to feed the country. 50% of the water goes to the environment. Hello? Now that's a nice little trade-off, but if you Read some of these articles, like in the LA Times and all that. Oh, farming uses 80% of the water. That's bullshit. Pardon me. That's not. That's so untrue. But yet they're made to look like the villain because of that 80%. It's not 80%. You know, but that just sticks. Nobody questions that. Nobody truth boxes that. You know, so they're they're made to look like the bad guy. Yeah, I mean, we're we're taking water, a, a, a resource, and we're producing a commodity, food, that everybody needs. And um, how can you villainize that or demonize that? Let me just give you an example of what we do with it. For instance, a cheeseburger. How much water does it take to make a cheeseburger? The bun itself, 34 gallons for each half of the bun. That is to grow the wheat to make the flour that gets turned into that bun. Slice of tomato, about three gallons. A little slice of lettuce, gallon and a half, not much. That slice of cheese that you so enjoy, 56 gallons for that one slice of cheese. That is to grow the feed, to feed the cow, to make the milk that gets turned into cheese. Now, the ground beef, 616 gallons. Again, to grow the forage, to feed the steer, to make the hamburger. Who's really consuming that water? Is it the farmer or is it the person eating the cheeseburger? Ironically, many of the progressive politicians and environmental lawyers who have championed the Delta smelt reside in the San Francisco Bay Area, which gets most of its water from the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir near Yosemite. Water from the reservoir is pumped across the valley, around the delta, and over the coastal mountains to the Bay Area. Not one drop is used for smelt protection. Their water just gets piped across, right across the valley, and into their homes. I have no problem with them having, having a beautiful city with water. I mean, I don't want to run anybody out of water. But at the same time, you can't take water that would be in this valley and take it for yourself. But then at the same time, say that the rest of the water that you're leaving us, you have to then leave that to the fish and you get none. What we're really seeing is a phenomenon of a very few elites in the coastal corridor being immune from the contradictions of their own ideology. By that I mean a botanist or a biologist or a scientist who wants to do something to the interior of California, engineer it in a way that was never intended by the architects of the water projects, himself won't suffer. It'll be somebody else. It'll be a farmer or farm worker. You know, we can do without lawns here. That's not a problem. We just want water for the food, keep people employed, feed people, feed the people that have the green lawns. We want them to eat too. Over 1.4 trillion gallons of water have been flushed through the delta and out to sea, trying to save the smelt. But after costing thousands of valley jobs and millions in lost economic activity, biologists now say the smelt will soon be extinct. The victims of natural predators, sewage from upriver cities like Sacramento and Stockton, and other factors not related to the pumps. No, 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 it's the pumps, it's the pumps, it's the pumps. Well, even by their own studies now, it's not the pumps. It's all these other things that were killing the smelt, but, oh, it's too late for that. You know? Well, and the striped bass, I mean, the striped bass is one that, that really gets me, right? Because the striped bass is actually a non-native fish mm -hmm. that's preying on the delta smelt. I mean, that's the amazing thing to me is that we're actually protecting a fish that's eating the endangered fish. I know. The, the whole thing hasn't made sense since day one. So what's, what's really afoot here? Is it just a whole thing to end farming? Well, if you, if you ask me... I would say yes. 
because yeah. that's what the that's what the groups told me back when I was first running for office, uh, and they have systematically delivered on their promise to idle a million acres of farm ground, mm-hmm. and they've been very successful at it, and we've paid for it, paid for it in water, in land, in our economy, and then we even paid them for their troubles to sue us. Filing lawsuits has become big business for environmental groups, a harvesting operation that generates millions of dollars to help pay overhead and fund additional lawsuits. For example, San Francisco-based Earth Justice had more than 375 active lawsuits pending in 2014 and has collected over $18 million in court-awarded attorney fees in the past five years. The Center for Biological Diversity has filed more than 500 lawsuits in California federal courts alone and between 2009 and 2013 collected more than $4 million in attorney fees. They collect millions while their relentless lawsuits lay waste to land that once grew food and provided jobs, destroying valley farms and the livelihoods of thousands of families. Look at the damage that they've done to this valley. Look at all the water that's been wasted over the last 20 years, all over one fish that's not even being saved. Despite claims by environmental groups that California is running out of water, the state would have ample water for cities, farms, and environmental protection, even during times of drought, but only with additional storage and more sensible water policies that balance the needs of people and fish. The fight is what are we gonna do to provide an even even remotely reliable water supply for California? You have to have storage and you have to have a way to move the water. It's not so much of a a water problem, it's a storage problem. We've got the damned water, we just don't have anywhere to put it in this area. So that's why we need storage. We've gotta have storage, 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 storage. So the next time there's a drought, we won't be sitting in this situation. In addition to more storage, the Delta pumps need to be returned to normal operation to increase water deliveries to 1992 levels. If you go back to the water supply that we had in 1992 and you build about three new storage projects, you will have plenty of water in this state. You could have more fish, you could have more recreation, you could have a better environment. In Congress, Devin Nunes has sponsored legislation offering a three-point solution to restore California water. The plan would return the Delta pumps to normal operation, turn the San Joaquin River into a year-round free-flowing river using recirculated water, and fast-track the approval of new water storage projects. You create year-round streams, you utilize the assets better and the water better, and you move it around more efficiently. That's what the House of Representatives bill does. It's actually better for the environment, unlike what you have today, which is just, you just cut the water off and flush it out to the ocean. You don't even regulate it. Nunez's water restoration plan has passed the U.S. House of Representatives the past three sessions, only to be killed in the U.S. Senate. About 2,800 miles from Washington, D.C., is the small valley town of Mendota. With unemployment hovering over 40%, families here feel the full force of congressional inaction. At the edge of town, surrounded by empty fields, is a small shanty village built in an old irrigation ditch. Many of the residents are unemployed farm workers who can no longer afford rent. Every day, Maria Hernandez brings food to share with the people of the village. I come and give food because it's the only food they uh, eat good. When she brings the food, they come out and they're grateful. And she has helped to relieve hunger at least for a day. And she does that every day. Well, you can't come out here and not see the human face of these kinds of policy decisions. Hopefully the people who see something like this, who become aware of this, 
would uh, encourage their, their representatives and their senators to act. Anything that doesn't help to restore um, uh, an active and fruitful use of the land is only going to engender more of this, not less. Why would we take the most abundant agricultural land in the world and turn it back to desert? Why would we punish the people who work the land, who do the hard, dusty jobs that others won't, to put food on our tables and help feed the world? With solutions at hand, why would we let this happen? there's water in one place and there isn't in another. Nothing could be more disastrous for this country than for the citizens of one part of the state to feel that everything that they have is theirs and it should not be shared with other citizens of this state.